been a little more like though getting a lay of the land that's before you. So with vision, you can see what's before you. And oftentimes, we imagine for our lives sort of two paths. One, one side, you can see pitfalls and you can see dangers. And uh, I don't want to go that way. On the other side, you can see, you know, something that looks pleasant to you, something that looks inviting, that looks really good. Hey, yeah, that looks great. I want to go that way. But we need to be aware also that there is the Lord's path. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, he says, You shall hear a word in your ear saying, This is the way. Walk in it. And that's what we want. That's what I want. We want to hear God's word in our ear saying, this is the way, walk in it. Because with our own understanding, with our own human wisdom, with our own fears and anxieties, we're going to make all kinds of decisions. That's not what we want to base our decisions upon. That's not what we want to base ministry upon or this church upon. We want to hear a word in our ear from the Lord saying this is the way, walk in it. And thank God we have his, his written word here, but we also have his spirit who speaks to us and gives us confirmation of direction. Of course, he'll never contradict his written word. Um, so a lot of times we might spend our time trying to identify what's bad, avoiding that, spending our time to find what's pleasant, but we want to go beyond that. And this applies to us individual. It applies to us corporately. And the thing that we want is the Lord's way. So when I'm talking about vision, the vision I want is God's will, God's heart, and his desire for us. So as a quick disclaimer too, um, as I share through my heart here that I I haven't shared publicly with, with you as a church, um, you're going to hear some things where maybe it, it, I just want to say this. There's going to be different specific vision God's, God gives to different churches. Okay? So I'm not, um, you know, some of what I share in the vision I believe God has given for us at Calvary Victoria, it's not intended to be a direct slam against other churches. That's what I'm telling you. Because you can hear things, you can run with it and get a zealous or something like that, and that's not, that's not the point of what I'm sharing. I'm just sharing my hope, and, and I hope that it gives you a greater understanding of who we are as a church and why we do uh, things the way we do them, why I do as a pastor. And in God's word, it's clear his desire is for us to be built up and as a spiritual house in the scriptures, Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. I'm not going to read the whole thing for sake of time right now, but uh, he's the cornerstone, Jesus is, and we're being built up, fit together. We're going to grow into the holy temple of the Lord, it says, and we're being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. That's what we are being built together as. We need to all yield to that work. It's a wonderful work. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16 speaks about that as well. In 1 Peter 2, 5, you like stones are being built up into a spiritual house. So we are being built up together as a body where Christ is the foundation, he, him and him crucified. It's also Christ is in us, through us, and, and he inhabits our gathering times. That's true. He inhabits the praises of his people and the times we gather together. Christ is in our midst in a special way, I believe. So where two or three are gathered together in his name, he's in the midst. Yes, he dwells in you as a believer at home on your uh, time at work or whatever, but as we gather, there's something to that as well, definitely biblically. So uh, I'm not going to talk about how that all works, though. The vision God's given, I'm going to share the vision God's given me for basically the environment by which that takes place. The how, how that all begins to happen in a group of people. So if you could imagine all the rock outcroppings around Victoria, whether it's Mount Doug or uh, in Esquimalt or Mill Hill or wherever you go, you, can, you get up there on Tolme and you can see. You, you, you get to the rock outcroppings around all the places we live all around here and you can see in the distance. And if you hear me out and receive this vision, I think it will help you sort of as an allegory, stand up on that high place and you're able to see. Oh, I understand more why Cameron does things the way he does or what his heart is and what the heart of this church is and so forth and the direction he has for us. So, and and you will see he wants to build us up a spiritual house. He wants to fit us together. But maybe you see that 
uh, down in the distance, and you're going, yeah, God wants us to be there, and how does it happen from here to there as a work of his grace? How does that happen, right? And, I mean, we could easily throw up big labels on the church and give us cool identity and get our own lingo going and all these things. Hey, the world does that. It's all the same, right? We're just a new club, a new clique. How does the Holy Spirit do that in a body of believers? That's what I want. When I read Acts 2, that's what I want, right? When, when they're meeting in Philippi, that's what I want. And it's amazing because it can never be forced. It can never be achieved through human means, through human endeavor, through human uh, manufacturing. God's work of his Holy Spirit can, will never work that way. And you can read through the kings and patterns in the Old Testament. And whenever they strived and whenever they were going to go out and do it for themselves and not rely upon the Lord, the Lord just backed right off. And he wasn't in the midst. And I don't want to be a place where God is saying, wow, that looks great. You guys have so many things. And he's standing on the outside of the door, Revelation 2, 3, knocking and saying, could I come in? Could I be part of this movement? You can have a movement without the movement of the Holy Spirit. And that's not what I want to do. So, standing on that high place, you can see several paths winding down, and it always goes through these trees and through a neighborhood maybe or something like that, and you're thinking, well, which path is ours? Which one do I take? I like to hike. I like to see the trailheads and the markings and the signs and so forth, and which one does the Lord want us to take? So, I'm going to take you through a few places in Scripture that will help you see why we're on the path we're on. And coming up to the trailhead, the first sign reads Ezekiel chapter 34. Please turn there in your Bible. The first sign reads Ezekiel 34, and then I see it says, God's heart for his flock. Ezekiel 34, God's heart for his flock. And now this may be a place that, uh, as you start reading it, it seems like an unlikely, obscure place. Maybe the trailhead is at this little spot where you're thinking, well, that's kind of out of place. And the first few steps look a little steep. And uh, why don't we take the easy path over here? And why don't we take the comfortable one over there, the one that looks exciting this way? But here's this sign, and it starts in what seems like an unlikely place, but I trust it will be clear to you soon. So God's given me a passion for this text, Ezekiel 34, and he gave it to me a long time ago before uh, Calvary Victoria started in 2011. But, um, and, and, I hope that I'm just, just going to be faithful with it and share it, but it is something deep in my heart, and I believe it refers to something deep in God's heart, Ezekiel 34 does. Verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. So it begins clearly, it's a shepherd analogy where the sheep are God's people, and where it was, it's speaking about Israel, yes, there, but where it's speaking about his, his church here, where the flock means his church, where the shepherd means overseers or pastors of his church. Okay, so in our case, believers in Jesus were the flock, were his flock, and pastors are, are the shepherds there. And that This analogy of shepherds and flock begins in verse 1 through 6 with two people, herding people and power-hungry people. That's where it begins. There's herding people and there's power-hungry people. And so we're hearing about bad shepherding of God's people, the flock. And he is not pleased with how they managed it, clearly. It's it's a rebuke that God has for him in verse 2. He says, you guys are feeding yourselves and not the flock. Shouldn't you be feeding the flock? In verse 3, they use the flock's resources for their own pleasures, for their own advantages, and they're not taking care of the lives of the very place where they're receiving uh, their advantage from. 
and off of, living off of. So verse 4 or 6 show they really have no regard to help or serve, but only to serve themselves. That's, they're not there to serve. And you see in verse 7, therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord, where God is sick of this, and he's going to step in. So verse 7 and verse 8 now says, As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, and they may no longer be food for them. So you're going to see the beginning of his heart here. I am going to step in, and I'm going to stop them from doing this. Is he passionate? Would you say he's passionate? Like, Cam, you're getting passionate. Well, yeah, you know what? I don't think I'm an inkling passionate compared to the Lord's heart in this. I, he, I, I believe when, the, when you read it and you keep reading it, he's just so passionate. There's a responsibility of the shepherds, and they are grievously abusing their privilege and rights. They are selfishly using the sheep and avoiding all responsibility to protect and feed the flocks. God is not pleased, and he holds them to account. I would not say it's a rebuke any longer. It is a condemnation. It's as if the boss comes to town, or it's as if the father puts some, some maids in charge of his household, his chil- children whom he loves or something like that, some sitters he left them in, in care of, and he shows up, and they just, it's not that they're just disregarding their responsibility, but they are completely irresponsible in bringing harm and ne- neglect to his loved ones. If I came home and found that someone was abusing my kids, I would be furious. I would be absolutely furious. And so would you, I think, if you came home and found someone abusing your children. Well, here is God finding that his shepherds are abusing the flocks. That's really what's going on, just because they're so selfish. And in fact, he's so passionate about this, he himself will step in from heaven and do something about it. Verse 11 says, For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. Verse 13, and I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel in the valleys and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their folds shall be on the high mountains of Israel. Therefore, they shall shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. Verse 15, I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. Does that remind you of any other passages? Look at verse 15 again. I will feed my flock. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. Turn to Psalm 23. Usually we don't read Psalm 23 with the same kind of intensity or passion. We read it with such gentleness and such grace and and so forth but it's the same words really in psalm 23 it's a well-known passage and and uh well let's just read it the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is from the vantage point of a sheep or a flock that is being governed, shepherded by Jesus. That's how they feel. That's how... They are, they, they are in security. They're, they're being fed. They're resting. They're being restored in their hearts and their souls. They're able to be in this wonderful place of knowing that, I, hey, even if there are enemies all surrounding, I don't have to worry about that. Jesus is going to deal with them. My shepherd has a rod. He has a staff, and he's going to hit them. He's going to take them out. How did David's sheep feel? How did King David's sheep feel? 
He was just a boy. He was a young man. He wasn't even the king yet. And he was made king because of his heart over the flock when he was just a youngster. And he saw that wolf coming, and he would fight that thing. The bear comes, and he, with his own hands, kills it, the lion and the bear. Wow. That guy can be king. Why? Because when, you know, simile, wolves, people come to attack the flock, he's going to be faithful to fight them off. And he's going to be faithful to defend and protect God's people, Israel. That's his heart. And Psalm 23, his desire is to feed. God's desire is to feed, to make his flock lie down in green pastures, still waters. That is such a beautiful picture. It also notes the souls being restored from times of turmoil, times of hurt, times of pain. The souls being restored. Why? Because it's been hurt. It says there's going to be a table before my enemies. That, in other words, there's going to be a plateau of green pasture. A plateau of green pasture, a table before my enemies. The, the head is anointed with oil. His presence is there. He is with them, caring for them, healing them. And, and they know they're safe and protected. In such a place, guess what's going to happen? Healing's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to minister to hearts. And I always read Psalm 23 as a personal reference until about three years ago. For some reason, the Lord just touched my heart and he said, Cameron, this is my heart for the church. And I went, whoa, it just blew my mind. And I thought, this is his heart for the church. I, I love taking it personally, and I will always take Psalm 23 personally, and so should you. But have you ever thought of it that way? God's heart for the church is that they would lie down in green pastures and be led beside still waters, and their soul would be restored. They'd be led in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The evil is about. They don't have to fear it because God is with them. That is a beautiful picture for a church. And I don't think, wow, Lord, do that in your church. And that became my prayer. See, there's a responsibility of leadership to help us as a body lay down a flock and rest and feeding where there is peace, where there is healing, not strife. It's, I've always said I don't want politics in church. I, I, I refuse to go be hired by churches as a pastor in the sense of being a hireling because it's just going to create politics. Pastor, you need to do things this way. You need to do things that way. I want to do things God's way. Well, what God's telling me is this. Oh, I'm glad that you sit there and you can tell pastors what to do. That's great. <laughs> but you know what? I don't want to do that. And, and so I love the autonomy and yet the f- true fellowship we have in Calvary chapels. I love the freedom that they bring with that Structure. There is structure. There is accountability. And truthfully, let me tell you, no one is accountable unless they want to be. It doesn't matter what structure you put around them in. Put around them. They could be in jail and be unaccountable. No one will be accountable unless they want to be, unless they're willing to be, if their heart is surrendered. And that starts with the accountability of you and the Lord. That's where it starts. And then to one another, and it branches out from there. But, hey, we try to manufacture these uh, church governments and all these other things to make sure why. So things progress, and so maybe once our people don't get hurt, or this happens and this happens, and you know what? Show me a great government in this world. What a mess. Jesus, the, the theocratic monarchy, that's the government, and that's the government of the church. That's what we want. The Lord's my shepherd. He's the shepherd of this place. And so there should be healing. And what a contrast with Ezekiel 34. You can turn back to Ezekiel 34 now. Ezekiel 34, in verse 4, it says that they have ruled them with force and cruelty. Now, again, they might not have made themselves appear this way, these shepherds. How do they even get in this position? Don't know. But here they are. And, and God looks at it and he goes, no, no, that's ruling with force. You're not really leading. You are driving people. You're not leading people. You're driving people. That's force, right? And cruelty. You're leading them with whips. You're leading them like like they're slaves or something. How are monuments built? How are great, in the past, great monuments, uh, talking about ancient times even, 
They're built on the backs of slaves, slave labor, right? And, and man wants to build a monument. Man wants to build a big name. They want to be that in the city. They want to be the up and coming. They want to be all that and everything else, and the label church is on it. But it might be driving. It might be pressure-driven, striving ministry. And I tell you, I just it's not in my heart. Don't want it there. In Ezekiel 34, again, verse 15, I will feed my flock. And he already called them my sheep in verse 11. He called them my sheep in verse 12. And I will feed them in verse 14 and 15, my flock. It's possessive. It's God's flock. It belongs to him. And yet it was entrusted to stewards for a time. Those stewards being overseers and pastors, shepherds, leaders. And in the context and biblical case of what was going on in Ezekiel, by the way, it's talking about the rulers of the land. It's talking about the elders, the kings, and the leaders of Israel governmentally. But transferring that to the church now in his heart, which has not changed yesterday, today, or forever, it's talking about the church. We can apply it there safely with interpretation. So we need to remember that it's his flock. How would he pastor? What does he want his fellowship to be like? And those overseers called out by Ezekiel treated the people like they were there to be used. Well, they're there to be used. They're for the using. Fleece one here. Push one over here. Make these ones go over here to get this work done. Get these ones there to get that work done. I can see what needs to happen. Oh, wolf's coming. Let the weak one feed it so it can just go away. I mean, just let's just maneuver things so that it, it's, it's all good for me. It's all good for whatever appearance's sake or whatever else. And they're there. They're doing a job. They're doing something. But they're being called out by the Lord, treating the people like they were there to be used. And really, it's this. It's where the flock is being used as a means to an end. By the way, I think doctrines can create this in ministries. I'll just tell you, I think Calvinism creates this in ministries. Because people become a means to an end. And even though it sounds great, God's glory is the end. You become, you become not the end of his love. You became a vessel and a tool to be used to God's end and his purposes. He didn't come to save you because he loves you. He came to save you to use you because what, does God need people? And it's not just that. It's other, it's other theologies that, do, that it does. I've seen it, you guys. It produces this in ministries, and the ministries can get this feeling like, well, we've got to get this done. This is God's mandate. And if I believed deep in my heart, it was God's mandate for X, Y, Z to happen in this city, then I, I probably would behave just the same. Because that is what God wants. That is God's will. That is God's calling. Therefore, you must buck up and we must all buck up and go do that because that's God's will. You know, I would, if I really believe that, I don't believe that. I believe his heart is like Psalm 23. I believe that he doesn't need any of us to do anything because he's God. Does he use people? Of course he does. Do we get to serve? Of course we do. But it's going to happen relationally as you are in the vine. It's going to happen as we are united with Christ and abiding in him. That's when it happens. There needs to be healing that goes on. There needs to be a heart that is developed in the security and love of Christ. What compels you to give up your life biblically? The love of Christ compels us. We judge thus that if one died for all, then all have died. It's the love of Christ that compels you. There is no greater motivator in your life. No, I must do God's will. I must do God's will. And God's will is this. God's will is for you to receive his love in such abundance that it changes who you are and all that you think and then motivates you for the rest of your life to receive the love of God. But we're so, hard, we're so bad at that because we, we want, we'd rather have a mission 
than to sit at his feet. Or we think it's just about sitting. Really, it's about being in Christ. And it's so hard for us to get. We can feel like we've done something. We can make our own measuring rod, whatever it is. People can be used to build up a reputation, the importance of a pastor, a name of a church, a name of a ministry. You can report it to your headquarters, and it looks good on paper, and they want to keep supporting you. When people are used for an agenda is the thing. Hey, it doesn't matter. Fleece them, push them, drive them, whatever, and sell them you love them all the while, but you're squeezing the life out of people until people don't have any life left, and then you kick them to the curb and get some fresh meat. That's the truth. Sorry I'm spelling out like it is, but it's the truth. And you get, see people get used up, and you see people get used up, and you see people get used up. Well, that's not the demographic we're looking for. We are looking for wonderful tithing units who are in their prime of life that have this and this and this going. Elderly homes, pff, special needs, pff, or whatever. Oh, no, no, it looks good, so let's go do it. And, you know, again, I am not calling out any ministry. I'd rather be innocent concerning that evil. I don't, I'm, I, because I've been here, I've been, but I have seen it before, okay? And I have met with people who are hurt. It happens all the time. And there are people, possibly right now, some of you, who won't talk to me because you're still afraid of pastors. You're still afraid of being hurt, possibly, right? I don't think trust me with all your heart. Trust the Lord with all your heart. But believe me, we want this to be a place where there is safety, where there is opportunity for healing and restoration. And this should make a pastor who has God's heart sick and angry. Because these shepherds in Ezekiel 34 are not seeking after the protection and blessing of God's people. And it is the call of the pastors to be as stewards under the great shepherd, the good shepherd, to oversee God's people, to guard and feed them. Verse 2 of Ezekiel 34, Woe to the shepherds who feed themselves. Should they not feed the flocks? Remember when Jesus had that meeting with Peter. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. He's just breaking his heart. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? You know all things. You know what a weak man I am. How pathetic I am. How much I've failed you, Jesus when I wouldn't stand by your side or pray with you all night in your suffering. And then Jesus says, what to Peter? Feed my sheep and tend my lambs. That's what he says to him. Here is Peter's commission. Feed my sheep and tend my lambs, Peter. He did not tell Peter to build his kingdom. Theology. He did not tell Peter to glorify God on the earth. Theology. Theology. He told Peter to feed his sheep and tend lambs. That is a tender term. Tend the lambs. Feed the sheep. And if you love me, Peter, as an overseer of God's people, that's that's what you're going to do. So, verse 16 in Ezekiel 34, I will seek what was lost, bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken, strengthen what was sick. I will destroy the fat and strong and feed them in judgment. Ouch. God is going to, he is going to, well, this, this passage will continue and tell you that. Judge between sheep and goats, basically. The tares and the wheat. The tares that grow up amongst the wheat in God's church. And he says, I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Jesus said the same thing. He said the exact same thing, right? And and Jesus' heart is to come for the sick and the poor, for the prisoner of the weak. And back in verse 4, in contrasting that, these shepherds would not strengthen the weak. They would not heal the sick. And his heart, Jesus' heart, is that he will strengthen the sick. Sick because why? They are malnourished. That's why people get sick most of the time, right? That's just a, a weak because they have been pushed aside. They've been pushed aside. The weak get weaker, the sick get sicker, and you're not doing anything about it, sort of. Jesus says, I'm going to do something about it. 
And, and again, in verse 16, he's going to seek that which was lost. Now, those taken into, is to, speaking in Ezekiel, those taken into captivity by the other nations around them. Because God's people, the leadership, would not follow God. Therefore, the nation was lost. And God's people got lost because the leadership would not follow. They abandoned the worship of God. But he says he'll go get them back. And his desire has always been to see them rest safe in their homeland. And if you stand up on the mountaintops in Victoria, even on the deck at my house where Heather and I get blessed to be at, you can see all the hills. You can see hillsides all over. It's just a beautiful landscape we have here, right? And I have always felt this, even before the birth here at Calvary Victoria six years ago, that there are sheep scattered on the hillsides, that there are herding people, that there are people hiding out, basically, and they're wounded. I believe there's a lot of Christians that don't even go to church. Tons. I'm not concerned, concerned about like, church transferring, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of people that aren't saved. And there's a lot of Christians that won't go to church, don't go to church. And granted, some people are looking for whatever they want at church and just don't find it, and there's some issues there or whatever, but it doesn't matter. Jesus' heart is to go reach out to them and love them. And they need a place that's not so man-mechanism-driven. They do. And that is part of the vision God's given me, that, it, that Calvary Victoria will be a place of healing, a place where it's okay to lay down and rest in green pastures. It's okay to have your soul restored. It's okay to not have to do anything for a season. It's okay to not get involved and serve. And yet I, I'm spinning my wheels at times going like, Lord, raise up laborers and servants for the work. I'm so busy or whatever. But I sure hope you don't feel like I've pushed you. I've pushed anyone into ministry. I've kicked people into it or whatever. I'm so frustrated. One time I remember getting frustrated with the, the coffee stuff or something like that. And then I think maybe it was Heather or something. All right, don't do it. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do it, you know. <laughs> and then the Morins came in the next Sunday. We want to do this. It's like, what? Wow, Lord? <laughs> like, okay. See, he knows. He knows your place in the body, like Jason was sharing earlier. He knows your place in the body, you know, and, and what am I? I'm just a guy who needs to be in my place in the body, right? And that's where we all are all at as his sheep. And I know on the other hand, there's models where churches get chewed up and spit out, right? I mean, pastors, excuse me. I meant to say pastors. And, you know, I don't want to be in that myself because I'm a sheep. I need to rest. I need to be in that place. So if I'm striving in an area, I need to stop it. If you're striving in an area, you need to stop it. Yet we need to yield to the work of the Lord in and through our lives. It's this wonderful thing of called walking in the Spirit, <laughs> of being in the Spirit, of hearing His voice, of hearing that word in your ears saying, this is the way, walk in it. And God has, the more I've sought Him, given me the vision of what I'm supposed to be doing. And then I get, you know, information coming to me. I get emails coming to me. I get whatever popular mainstream Christian magazine on the internet or whatever coming to me. And it's like, oh, yeah, if only church was like that or something like this. And the, no, I need to do like this. Here's what God's calling me to do. And that's cool. That's fine if he's called some other ministry to do some other thing or whatever else. What is he calling me to do? What is he calling us to do as a fellowship? You know, not to be like everyone else at all. That's not God's desire. We're not like everyone else. We're a unique representation of God's love on earth, his light, we're his body. And he cares for us. And I really think that this, this vision is foundational for a healthy church. I do. I think it's foundational. Because it's the heart of Christ. And the heart of Christ is that foundation who he is, what he's done for us. We don't build upon striving, right? Let each one who builds on this foundation take heed how he builds upon it. How he builds upon it, with what heart, with what spirit, with what motivation leadership builds upon that foundation. Hey, feed God's people. Give them rest. 
You know, people have been scattered, taken out by winds of doctrine, churches broken apart by their departure from God's word, their departure from his spirit. And people are afraid. People are afraid. A f- perfect love cast out fear, 1 John 4, 18. People are afraid of church at times. Afraid to be open at church. And Jesus will bind up the broken, he says here in verse 16 of Ezekiel 34, where the, previously the condemned shepherds, their rebuked ones, did not bind up the broken. The broken are those who have been attacked by wolves. They've been broken. They've been attacked, and they weren't kept safe. Verse 17 of Ezekiel 34, As for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God. So now he's spoken to the overseers. Now he's going to talk to the flock. Behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture? And to have drunk out of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet, and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. So here's some sheep amongst the flock who themselves go and they find the good pasture, they chomp it up, and then they trample all over it, and those behind them can't get anything good. It's muddy. And then they go to the clean water, and they get there first, and they drink it up, and then they walk through it, mudding it all up for the rest of the flock. Whoa, God says he's going to judge between sheep and sheep. Verse 20 continues, Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. The fat and the lean, the pushing of the weak, the fat ones are pushing the weak. And that's speaking about those who are in the body, in the flock, and leadership is part of that, I believe, yes, but there is a responsibility that is greater and an accountability that's greater, but those within the flock who oppress others amongst the flock, who oppress one another, that should not be happening, where there is a, a, a pressing of one another within God's body. God won't only judge the shepherds, overseers, also those who follow their bad example, those who follow their bad example of taking what you can get for yourself. That's what it is. I'll just take what I can get for myself. This is, the church is not like the rat race of the world. It's very different. It's very different. It's not like business. It's not like marketing. It's not like postal codes and zip codes and let's mass mail out and find out the demographics and blah, blah, blah and get our church in the right position and build it. It's not that. Church is, it's led by the Holy Spirit. It's to be led by the Holy Spirit to be, we're feeding the word of God. We need to hear from him and go where he says. It's not marketing material mechanics. It's not purpose, like, filled, driven of machine run, all this stuff. It's not that. And the example that gets provided is a bad one. And then people think it's just got to get part, you're part of the machine. What if we all just broke down one Sunday and needed to sit and pray together? You know? <laughs> and when you read Psalm 23, Jesus never led into muddy pastures. Jesus didn't lead them to muddy waters. It was the steer, still clear water, green pasture. That's how he led. What a contrast. But get the trampling by those with their weight. So in Jesus' pasture, there's enough for everyone. And if someone's not doing well, judge them. No. Lift them up. Bear one another's burdens. Do we see them and have compassion and help them? Verse 23 in Ezekiel 34, I'm not going to read much more of it, just 23 and 24. I will establish one shepherd over them. He shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, David's already passed now. He's with the Lord. But this is talking about the millennial reign, when Jesus comes as king to reign, and how he's going to govern. And David is going to be there, reigning with him. 
It's true, prophetically, eschatologically. But the heart of David is given there. And he says he's going to reign. He's going to do it. His heart for overseers. And, and David, I already gave as an example. He's going to lead his flock. He's going to oversee them. He's going to feed them. And turn, in closing, we're going to look at John 10. Jesus is going to oversee his flock. And didn't he do that when he came and established his church? Absolutely, that's, that's what Jesus has done. So in John chapter 10, most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door. And who's the door? Jesus is the door. So you enter the sheepfold by the door, Jesus, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. If you don't have Jesus' heart in the sheepfold, you got the wrong heart. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And may God bless us and give us hearing ears. This is the way, walk in it. You shall hear a word in your ear saying, this is the way, walk in it. You shall hear his voice. This is the way. This is, this is my spirit. This is how, this is church, etc. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Verse 7, then Jesus said to them again, most truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. There is pasture in Christ. Verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling who is not the shepherd One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And he speaks about laying down his life. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But the bad shepherds will use the flock to meet their end purpose. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep because they are the end purpose. Not to meet some other purpose. Is Jesus so interested in what he can get out of us? Is that what he's so interested in? I don't think so. Will he love you more if you serve him more? If you do more? If you strive more? You know, will he love you more? And if you do less and so forth? Is it conditional? Is his love for you conditional? I just want to say, you aren't a means to an end. Okay? And that's not God's heart. And... You remember that story where Jesus talked about, he, he heals a man who's blind. And he says, what do you see? The man says, I see men like trees. And Jesus says, that's not right. So he does, it's the only place where Jesus like heals a guy twice in the same scene. You know, he didn't rise, Lazarus. Oh, whoops, let's reboot that one. Ver, version two, he's half dead. Rise again, Lazarus. No, this guy, he heals him from his blindness, asks him what he sees. He sees men walking like trees, and then Jesus has to heal him again of seeing men like trees. Trees to be cut down, to be carved up, to be used. That's not the way to see people. That's not the heart of Jesus. You don't see people right. People aren't a means to an end. That's the world's mind. That's how cities and nations are built, expensing, you know, the lives of others. And God's heart for leadership is not to abuse their position and privilege, but it's it's one of servants, not lords, right? That's God's heart. Remember Gideon, who was called to be a leader of God's people. Where did did he find Gideon? 
who was the least of, his, least of the tribes, the least family in this clan, and the least of the least of the least, hiding in a hole. Gideon, you mighty man of valor, I'm calling you, right? God's not looking for the mighty. He's not looking for the, uh, those with the great wisdom and ability. He's looking for the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. He's looking for available, weak vessels. He's looking for, for just hearts that he can fill with his love, really. And that's unstoppable. Just as David wasn't standing tall among the others. So, I say what's important to God in this passage where he is so full of his passion. In Ezekiel 34 and Psalm 23 and John 10, his heart is for the flock, the flock, the flock. He laid down his life for the flock. He would lay down his life for them. That's his heart. And that is the heart that shepherds, that are under shepherds of Christ, need to have. And, And when you see that foundation... That is a good work. That is a place, think about this, where there is guarding and feeding. That is a place where healing happens. That is a place where God touches lives. That is a place where the word just, what do people need? Feeding. Well, we eat, we grow, we develop. Keep feeding. We grow, we develop. We get washed by the waters that are clean. We grow, we develop in the Lord. And the callings, and the gifts that God has given everyone will show up as we mature in Christ, as we grow and mature in him. It is a supernaturally natural work that God does. Not a, not a survey of spiritual gifts or striving or whatever. It's a supernaturally natural work. Where when, when there is that environment of feeding and rest and healing, growth happens in that environment. Real growth. Real growth from the inside. So it's not our job to build the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And boy, you've got to fight against that a lot of times. Oh, but if we do this, and that, then the church will be built. It's like, whoa. Nowhere does he tell his disciples to build the church. Find me the scripture. It's not in your Bible. It's not there. What does he tell leaders to do? Guard and feed. That's what he tells them to do. And watch him do a work by his spirit in everyone's life where they're being built up and where they're growing in Christ. And then watch people. Man, I got a heart for this. I got a heart for that. Praise the Lord. All right, let's do that. That's where service comes in. It's the heart of Jesus. And when we start serving, you'll find that you're not striving and God keeps touching the heart from that relationship and those gifts show themselves and develop in time. In time, and the church is being built up. But we're being built up, aren't we? In the Word of God, as we continue through the Word of God, as we study the Word of God, that's why we give big place to sitting and studying. Time comes when you go and do. But you can be a Martha ministry or a Mary ministry. And Jesus said Mary chose the better part. He did. The better part is to abide in Christ and to sit at his feet. And from that fullness, go in love and serve in his name. That is the better part. Lord, we pray that you would bring our fellowship to a sincere place of humility and trust and that we would be one where we are waiting upon you, resting in you, resting on the finished work of Christ. And Lord, if I've misspoken anything, just clear that from the record and touch my heart. And I pray, Lord, that everyone would get the right message from this the right vision, 